Suppose you're building your application to manage your calendar using natural language. Let's say you want the user to tell the application when he wants to have the meeting in natural language. So the input will be something like Thursday from noon to 6 p.m. In order for your application to do anything with this data, it needs to be transformed into a structured format like JSON. This is a fairly straightforward task for large language models, and both Cloud and ChatGPT were able to get this quite easily. However, both models also added some extra information, like explaining the output. So your application will need to have logic to strip out this type of information. There is also some ambiguity on how exactly the output should be given. For example, should the day of the week be given in lowercase or uppercase? To some extent, these problems can be fixed using heuristics and prompt engineering. But there is a new technique, structure generation, that can make the LLM generate the correct format 100% of the time. My name is Bai, I'm a machine learning engineer and a PhD in natural language processing. And in this video, I will explain structured output in LLMs and how it works. Structured outputs are useful for developing many applications, and recently OpenAI and many others have added support for this feature. Let's do a quick example of how to use structured outputs with OpenAI models. We first define the weekday literal type that represents the seven days of the week. Then a day schedule is an object containing a day of the week and a start and end hours in 24 hour format. Finally, a week schedule is a list of day schedules when you are able to meet at several different days of the week at different times. This is in Pydantic, which is a type validation library in Python. If you prefer TypeScript over Python, then Zot is a similar type validation library. When making the request, we can pass in the Pydantic object into the request, along with the input that we want the model to parse, and the model returns a response that corresponds to the format that we specified. The output of the model will not be correct 100% of the time, but what we can guarantee is that the format will always correspond to the format that is specified. Currently, only the basic Pydantic and Zod features are supported in this API, like lists and objects. More advanced features like regular expressions and validator functions are not supported at this time, but maybe in the future. There are open source models that can produce structured outputs as well, which I'll be covering next. Before we continue, let me share something I've been working on. VoiceWriter is a tool to help you write faster using voice. Simply speak your thoughts, and the AI will fix your grammar and add punctuation in real time. It uses advanced speech recognition models, and I use it every day to write things much faster, including my emails and my daily stand-up updates. You can also use our Chrome extension to use VoiceWriter on any website. Try it for free at voicewriter.io. Now back to the video. One open source package that supports structured outputs is the Outlines library. Here's an example of how to use it. You can use any open source model with this library. Similar to the OpenAI example, the formatting is given as a Pydantic schema and passed into the generate function. And here is what is produced, an output JSON in the format that we specified. Another cool thing that you can do in the Outlines library is make a model generate an output that matches a regular expression. This is a regular expression that matches a year, so like, which year did something happen? We assume that a year consists of between 1 and 4 numerical digits, so up to a um, 4 digit number, and then optionally the two characters BC if the year is something about ancient history. We give it a list of questions involving years, like which year did America gain independence? And the model correctly answered 1776. Overall, it did a pretty good job. I'm not a history expert, but there is maybe one that looked a little bit questionable. An interesting thing with the outlines library is everything is converted into a regular expression under the hood. Even when the original task is to generate a structured JSON, the library first converts this schema into a regular expression and then makes the model to generate something that corresponds to this regular expression. Normally, regular expressions are associated with things like matching emails or phone numbers, and not JSON validation, but we'll see later why this makes sense. And you can verify that this kind of complicated regular expression actually does indeed match the structure that we want. In formal language theory, the things that can be recognized by a regular expression is called the regular languages. And one property of these languages <laughs> is they can be recognized by something called a finite state machine or a finite automaton. A finite state machine looks something like this. 
So you start at some state, and every time you read a letter, you uh, follow the arrow with that letter, and you keep going, reading one letter of your input at a time until you finish reading your input. And if you end up in a state that has this double circle, then it's called an accepting state, and you accept. And if you end up in a state that only has a single circle, then you reject. And if you are in a state and you read a symbol that doesn't have an arrow next to it, then you also reject. There is a theorem in formal language theory that says every finite state machine corresponds to some regular expression. So here is the regular expression that corresponds to this particular finite state machine. Another example is this regular expression that we had before. And here is the finite state machine that recognizes this regular expression. So for any regular expression you give me, I can construct a finite state machine that recognizes this regular expression. And this is in fact how regular expression engines are implemented. So then how does this help us with making the language model output something that follows a regular expression? Um, the process is actually pretty simple. In this section, I will describe the following paper written by the authors of the outlines library. The basic idea is you keep track of which of these states you are currently in when you're generating the next token. So you know which tokens are valid from the current state and which ones are not. Let's say you're generating and you started with the tokens 1, 9. So then you're 1 and then 9. So you're in state 2. We feed this into the language model, which gives us an output distribution of what the next token should be. And then for each token, we can look at the state machine to see whether it is a valid token or not. So for example, the token 1 is valid, um, 2 is also valid, um, 3, 4 is also valid, but 5, 6, 7 is not. Because if you just follow all the characters, like 5, uh, 6 is okay, and then 7, there is no transition from this state. So you fall off the state machine, which means you can never reach an accepting state from here. So 5, 6, 7 is not valid from state 2. We repeat this for every possible token that you might generate at this step and mark each token as either valid or invalid. Okay, so now we have a list of which tokens are valid at this step, which is basically a binary mask. So then we filter out the tokens that are invalid, and from these ones that are valid, we can normalize and then sample from this list. So if we just continue doing this, then at the end we will get something that always fits the regular expression. One issue here is performance, like if at every step I have to go through all possible tokens and figure out which ones are valid and which ones are invalid, that's going to be expensive. Especially since there is a lot of possible tokens, like the Lama models have a vocabulary of 128,000. Uh, but one useful property with finite state machines is it doesn't have memory. So what it means is it only cares which state you're currently on. It doesn't care which uh, steps you took to get to this state. So you could have reached this state with 1, 9, or 2, 0, or any other combination of letters, but none of that matters because you're currently on state 2. And we know that whenever you're on state 2, these are the possible tokens that we can generate at this step. So what you can do to speed things up is pre-compute for every possible state, what are all the possible tokens that you can generate starting from that state. This will take some time, but if you are doing a lot of generation with the same model, then this could speed things up. So far, we've been focusing on regular languages, which is the simplest type of grammar. But sometimes this is not enough, and we need to go up one step of the Chomsky hierarchy to what's called the context-free languages. Context-free languages let you have multiple levels of nesting, which is not possible using regular languages. So to detect whether a string like this has a set of balanced parentheses or not, is not possible using a regular expression, but it is uh, possible using a context-free grammar. There is a good chance that you don't actually need a context-free grammar though. I looked at the documentation for OpenAI Structured Output API, and it turns out they only support five levels of nesting. And in fact, a structured JSON with limited level of nesting can be parsed with regular expressions. But if we have some deep levels of nesting, like um, syntax tree of a programming language, then regular expressions will not be sufficient, and we need something stronger, like a context-free grammar. The simplest way to do this is by incremental parsing, and let me show you what I mean. Here we have a simple context-free grammar using the log library. It parses expressions involving arithmetic operations like plus, minus, multiply, divide, and um, multiple levels of nesting using brackets. 
Let's try actually running it. Um, first, we give it the string one plus two, and it gives us back this uh, parsed structure, which is a syntax tree because it's a valid string in the grammar. Um, what if we give it a string bracket one plus? So this string is not a valid expression, but it could be if we just added more things to it. And the parser raises the unexpected end of file exception because it's expecting more characters. But on the other hand, if we give it a string that is not only a not valid parse, but also could not be a valid parse even if we added stuff to the end of it, then it gives us a different exception. So based on which exception is thrown, we can tell whether what we have so far is a valid incremental parse or not. In the decoding stage of an LLM, you will have a prefix, and then you're checking which tokens am I allowed to generate at this step. Am I allowed to generate the plus token right now or not? And if we check and we get the end of file exception, then we know that yes, the plus token is valid. We can continue doing this and continue generating strings that are valid in the grammar. But unlike the finite state machine method that we've seen before, here there's no way to pre-compute anything. And we have to check at each step every token in the vocabulary to check which ones are valid at this step. So this method is relatively slow. A faster way to generate something that fits a grammar is using a more advanced type of state machine called a pushdown automaton. This is similar to the finite state machine that we saw earlier, but we give it a stack. How it works is at each step, we can look at one token of input and also what's at the top item of the stack and together make a decision of what to do at this step. It can then transition to a different state and at the same time, add something to the top of the stack if it wants to. And this modified state machine is able to recognize context-free languages. This way we can generalize the state machine algorithm that we saw earlier. The main difference is that in addition to the state, we also need to look at which item is at the top of the stack and the combination of these two allows us to pre-compute what are the possible tokens that are valid at this step, instead of having to check at every step which tokens are valid um, that we will have to do if we're using an incremental parser. There is one fundamental issue though, when you try to combine context-free grammars with LLMs. I'm going to call it the token terminal mismatch problem. In a context-free grammar, you start with a complicated expression and you decompose it step by step into a um, sequence of terminals. So a terminal is something like open bracket or closing bracket or a number. These terminals are quite different though from LLM tokens, which are trained statistically. Here's an example from a GBT4 tokenizer, and we can see lots of mismatches everywhere. For example, the two opening brackets is one token, and as well as this closing bracket and minus combination is one token. And sometimes a number, like 100,000, is broken up into two tokens. And this is a general problem that will come up in any grammar, not just my grammar. Like here is a random line of Python code. On the left is the tokens that the Python parser would see, and on the right is the GPT-4 tokenizer. They have roughly the same number of tokens, like 19 tokens versus 18 tokens on the right. But the tokens in these two cases look quite different. For example, the last token here is a combination of the last character of the string token and followed by the next three tokens, all combined into one LLM token. This causes a lot of difficulties when using automata to um, parse LLM tokens. Because imagine all of these transitions, they're not characters, but rather like numbers. So whenever you're in state 3, and the next token is a number, like a thousand, then you transition to state 4. But what if you have a token like 9 closing bracket 4? Then it becomes really complicated to figure out whether this is even valid, and if so, which state are you supposed to transition to, because you might be in the middle of processing a number. What can we do about this problem? Well, the easiest thing we can do is just ignore it. So you can say like, look, this token here is just causing too many difficulties. So you're not allowed to finish one terminal and start a new terminal in the same token. And this can kind of work, but it is over constraining. So you can expect the accuracy to degrade a little bit. There are some quite innovative ways that people have tried to solve this problem. And now we're really getting into cutting edge machine learning research, like papers that were published just a few months ago. This paper here does something called vocabulary aligned subgrammars. And basically what they do is they have a grammar and they also have the character scanner. So they keep track of their position inside the inside a single terminal. And at the same time, they also keep track of the parse tree. The method is quite complicated and I don't completely understand how it works. 
but this method keeps track of both the scanner as well as the parser position at the same time, and together this can filter out effectively which tokens are allowed at this step, without having to go through the effort of checking every possible token at every step. Another paper that was published recently from DeepMind involves state machine composition. So what's happening here is, they have this state machine for the pushdown automaton, and then they have a separate finite state machine that basically models the tokenizer. This is a state machine that basically takes as input the LLM tokens and outputs the characters. And there are methods to basically combine together these two state machines using an operation called composition. And what you get here at the end is a state machine that recognizes the grammar, but instead of taking um, terminals from the grammar as its transitions, all of its transitions here are tokens from the language model. And this way, the tokens from the LLM are no longer mismatched from the grammar terminals. As you can tell, this is a really exciting and active research topic, and there are many papers at every machine learning conference about how to better do structure generation. The final thing I'm going to talk about is something more practical, how to make the model accurate when doing structured outputs. This paper found that many models performed less accurately on benchmarks when being forced to output in a specific format. Like this model, when being forced to output in the JSON format, it gave an output that was in the right format, but the actual answer was incorrect. And when the model was asked to output just in natural language, like without any formatting constraints, then it got the right answer. They tested a bunch of different models on several benchmarks, and they found a pretty consistent pattern. The more you constrain the model, the worse the performance gets. And this is something to keep in mind if you're using these systems in practice. It's better to be less restrictive in the formats that you allow the model. Like this example from the beginning, um, the output could be Thursday with lowercase or Thursday with uppercase. The lesson from this paper is you should probably accept both, because if you constrain it to be one or the other, then the model will become less accurate. Anyways, that's it for this video, and I hope you found it helpful. And if you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to my channel to stay in the loop when I post new similar videos like this. Goodbye.